Welcome to our 650 webinar, Health Screening and Vaccination Best Practices. My name is Ryan Parker. I'm the Chief Legal Product Officer here at 650. And with me today is Marie Coolbeth. Marie wears a lot of hats at 650. Uh, she is both our General Counsel and a Vice President of Legal Product. In addition, uh, Marie helps a lot of our privacy customers and is a, a privacy expert. She probably helped more companies with CCPA and GDPR uh, compliance than anyone else in the country. And we're really grateful to have her here with us. Marie and I are both attorneys uh, and uh, are excited to talk to you about some legal issues. We'll be providing legal information, not legal advice, uh, but we're excited to dig into what I think are some of the most interesting legal issues that companies are facing today. As I look at our participants uh, in today's webinar, I see a lot of familiar names uh, and friends that have joined us for past webinars and customers. I also see some new names. And so I'll just give you a brief introduction to 650 for those of you that are new. Uh, at 650, we're the technology, the legal technology subsidiary of the law firm Wilson Sonsini. And our goal is to make the law more accessible for companies and individuals. And the way we do that is we combine technology and legal expertise to try to create products that make the law easier to navigate uh, and less expensive. And we have uh, launched a number of different products in the privacy realm, uh, including CCPA and GDPR compliance. We're currently working on a PIPL uh, document package, which for those that are following the privacy space, you may know that that is China's new data privacy law. So watch out for more information on that. On the employment side, we're helping hundreds of companies with the return to their work sites with our return to work tool set. Uh, we also have a, an electronic uh, employee handbook and a diversity, equity, and inclusion tool set that are helping companies uh, in what we're calling employment 2.0, this new realm of employment. And so we have a lot of experience talking to companies and, and helping them with the, the types of issues we're gonna talk about today, which are health screening and vaccination best practices. And we're excited to talk to you about some best practices and, and trends that we're seeing. We also would love for this to be a dynamic discussion. And so if you have questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, put your questions in there. We'll try to answer them uh, live if we can. If we can't get to them, we'll answer them, send them out later. Um, we have some time for Q&A at the end. If we can see relevant questions, we may answer them also throughout the process. Uh, please don't put them in the chat because it's a little harder for us to uh, catalog those and make sure that we've hit all your questions. Um, with that, I think we're ready to get started. I'll just uh, mention that we also have captioning for today's webinar, um, and we, we hope that that will be accurate. If you have questions about uh, what we do at 650, please feel free to visit us at www.650, and that's 650 spelled out, uh, as you see uh, in my background here, uh, slash uh, employment. And we've just put that in the chat uh, for those that would be interested in, in learning more about 650 and how we uh, help companies with employment uh, issues. So without further ado, let's move uh, right into our webinar today. So we have a, a number of different topics we're going to cover, and I'll, I'll go over our agenda here. Uh, we're starting with introductions. We're almost through that part. Um, and then we'll move on to vaccine guidance and policies. Uh, Marie will talk to us about that. Then we'll talk about health screening now and moving forward. Health screenings become a big issue uh, that a lot of companies are thinking about. And then we're lucky to have Marie here to talk to us about HIPAA and CCPA and other privacy considerations related to the pandemic, and especially as that concerns health screening and vaccine guidance. And that's, you know, we, we get a lot of questions about the privacy considerations uh, that go into both of those topics, gathering vaccine information and health screening information. And so we'll dive into that next. Uh, we'll then turn to best practices and helpful, helpful resources for you as a company uh, as you're working through um, these types of issues. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So feel free to put those questions in the Q&A. We'll answer them as we go along and we'll have a Q&A at the end before we conclude our webinar. And with that, I'm excited to turn the time over to Marie Colbeth. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Appreciate the introduction that you gave us there. Um, I am having a little bit of trouble on the slides on my end, so apologies. Uh, I think it's come up now. So if we could advance one more slide. Um, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to start off today by talking a little bit about vaccination policies. 
best practices on those and what your options are, especially because right now we're experiencing a lot of change due to the increase in the Delta variant. Um, so basically, uh, those of you who've joined us for these webinars before are aware that you have really three options when it comes to establishing a vaccination policy for your workplace. Those are that you require that your employees be vaccinated in order to come to the company work sites, that you encourage your employees to get vaccinated, but you don't require it. Or your last option is that you don't act. And by don't act, we mean that you choose not to adopt any vaccination policy with regard to your employees. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw, well, not the beginning of the pandemic, when the vaccinations first received their emergency use authorization, we, see, we saw a lot of companies very hesitant to act because there was still a lot of um, just, I, I think discomfort might be the right word, and that they knew that employees had, that they were wondering, you know, what sort of impact would it have? Would we have legal liability because, you know, these vaccines were approved through emergency use authorizations? So a lot of companies were hesitant to act very quickly, but now, you know, we're in a very different situation and we have started to see, especially with the Delta variant um, on the increase and the increasing number of hospitalizations that we're seeing, um, at, particularly among the unvaccinated population, more companies have started to either require it in order to come into the workplace or to increase the encouragement that they're offering to their, um, to their workforces. So those are the options. Um, and then, of course, you have to kind of decide, well, within those options, what does that mean for our company? And so I want to spend a little bit more time talking about the required version of this. So if you require vaccinations in your workplace, you need to remember that you should only be requiring them for employees that are reporting to a work site or are somehow interacting with other individuals as part of their work. So if your workforce is remote, they're all working from home, they're not, you know, they're not in pods together somewhere, they're not, you know, having off-site meetings where everybody's still together in a room as if they were at the work site. If your employees aren't doing those things, having a, vac a mandatory vaccination policy is something you're gonna have a hard time justifying um, from a legal perspective. However, if people are coming in, if they are interacting with other employees, with customers, with vendors, um, and you want to have a policy that mandates um, vaccination, legally you're allowed to do that. And there's a few main um, legal regimes that companies want to pay attention to. Of course, you also need to think about your state requirements, but from the um, general perspective, you have the EEOC. And one of the main concerns was that you might be committing an EEOC violation because these vac vaccines were approved under emergency use authorization. And the EEOC has come out with guidance saying that you are allowed as, an as a company to mandate your employees be vaccinated when it's still under emergency use authorization. That's the EAU acronym you see on the screen. Um, similarly, uh, we recently had an updated uh, set of guidance come out of the DOJ because uh, some other companies were concerned that, well, it might not be an EEO violation, it might be um, a violation of the FDA itself to mandate use of an emergency of a vaccine that's only under EAU. The DA, DOJ looked into that and they said, no, that's not a claim. You don't need to worry about that. You're fine. Um, and then we also have some case law that we can now look at. So um, in the state of Texas, uh, we had Houston Methodist Medical. Um, it's, it's a large hospital organization um, with thousands of employees. I, I want to say upwards of 20,000 employees it had a mandatory vaccination policy in place. A group of employees um, sued saying that it was uh, discriminatory and for other reasons illegal um, and the case was thrown out and they appealed and it was upheld on appeal. So we've also seen you know case law out of some of the more conservative jurisdictions regarding the vaccination question um, that are still upholding you know vaccination requirements by employers. So if, if those are your concerns I, I would say you know we've seen a lot supporting your ability to have these required um, regimes at your company. Um, and then if we could go one, one slide further for everybody. The other part is we now are in a changed environment. And if you still have concerns about um, emergency use, use authorization, we have just had the Pfizer vaccine receive its full authorization under the FDA. It's no longer under EAU. So for anybody who's 16 and over, which for the most part is anybody who could potentially be an employee, um, they do have the potential of receiving a vaccine that's received full authorization under the FDA. Um, it is still under the 
uh, emergency use authorization for 12 to 15 year olds and for people that are receiving a booster. Um, we, we aren't in a position yet to be in a place where we would recommend that companies require vaccination boosters, uh, just because that's still like the guidance is still murky from the CDC. We're waiting for further authorizations. They have been authorized with emergency use, but again, mandating something where we're still trying to get people to receive the basic level of vaccination isn't something that you really want to be wading into. Um, but again, we do see some changing trends you know, more people are now getting vaccinated. Um, you know, we had seen a big dip in vaccination numbers are coming back up because of the Delta variant um, in terms of the number of people that are now going in to, to get vaccinated on a daily basis. Um, and we've also seen some survey information suggesting a change as well, which is that um, the Kaiser Family Foundation did a survey and found that one third of unvaccinated people did say that they were more inclined to go in and get the vaccine after it received full approval. So with this um, Pfizer approval, we're probably going to see an increase in vaccinations because of that as well. We're also seeing more companies mandating vaccinations, and this is large companies. Um, so, you know, Google, Walmart, Disney, they're all mandating vaccinations for some of their employees. We also have more than 600 colleges and universities that are mandating them for students, staff, or both. So um, again, if some of the concerns are about leading out, um, you know, we, we've definitely seen that uh, these policies are being implemented by a lot of employers. Uh, you wouldn't be alone. Um, and that we've gotten a lot of guidance suggesting that you would be in a safe place from a position of, you know, do you have the right to mandate that of your employees? So uh, that's just sort of one of, the, one of the main changes we wanted to address. Now, we also wanna talk about um, deciding how to collect vaccination information. If you have either required policy or policy where you're encouraging vaccination, um, how does that work with collecting vaccination information? And one of the um, most important things to think about, we'll spend a few minutes a little while later talking about privacy requirements, but you know, you can require proof and keep a copy. So they have to show you their vaccination card, you keep a copy of it. You can require proof, but not keep a copy, you just notate it. Um, so you know, somebody shows an HR rep or someone designated on your staff their card, they record it and that's it. Um, and the other way that you can collect proof is by requiring employees to sign a self attestation form attesting to their vaccination status. So those are um, sort of the three main approaches. And you know, you can choose any of those. We'll talk about the privacy reasons for choosing one over the other in a minute. Um, but the final thing to think about is just, you know, how do you decide? So we've sort of talked about the scariest ones from the legal perspective, the fact that you can have that type of policy in place. But how do you decide if that's what you want, right? Um, and so for hybrid and multi-jurisdictional workforces, which are what we're seeing more and more of now, um, there's just some considerations to have. You know, um, you have employees who are working remotely. They don't have in-person contact with coworkers or customers. It, that, that's a group of you know, workers that you don't need to require vaccination for. Um, but if they want the option to come in, that changes that analysis. Um, and also reasonable accommodations. If you have a required policy, you need to also provide for reasonable accommodations for individuals who um, have a medical condition or religious belief that would prevent them from getting vaccinated. So, um, you know, is working from home a reasonable accommodation for that group? If it is, can you provide it? Um, if there's no reasonable accommodation, if you have a workforce or a subset of your workforce that has to come in to perform their work, um, could you somehow still protect them and have them be on site unvaccinated if the majority of your workforce is following your mandatory vaccination policy. So thinking through, you know, how are we gonna handle those situations? Um, and then whether those policies should be different at different office locations. So, you know, maybe you have uh, some of your workforce that's located in an area with lower transmission and you have other offices or work sites in areas that are higher substantial transmission. So thinking about the on the ground situation at the different sites and whether you might need to have a separate policy for each of those or whether you could have a unified policy for the entire company. And those are some of the main considerations right now with vaccinations. And they're, they're tied pretty closely though to what's going on with health screening requirements. So I'm gonna let Ryan talk about those. And, and Marie, but before we move into health screening, we got some interesting questions that touch on 
uh, some of the things that you've covered. We also have some interesting questions about collecting and storing vaccination information that we might save for the next section that you're going to cover. But let me uh, tee up a couple of the questions that we got that, that this might be a good time for us to answer. One asks whether uh, what a company should consider if they're not requiring their employees to come in. They're welcome to come in, but they're not required to do so. Maybe how that weighs with having a mandatory vaccination policy. Yeah, and that's actually one of the easier situations in which to have a mandatory vaccination policy because you're in no way requiring, you're saying it to everybody, you can still do your work at home. It, you know, we don't have any preferences. But if you choose to come in, you have to be vaccinated. That's actually the, the policy that we're following at 650 right now. Yeah. Um, if you come into the work site, which is um, completely uh, at your own, by your own choice, then you, you have to be vaccinated. And you also have to fill out a daily health screener um, because we do want to keep track in case we have a breakthrough case. We want to keep track of who might have been exposed at the work site. Another question we got here, and I think this, is, this should be an easy one. It says, to clarify, if the vaccine is no longer under EAU, emergency authorized use, then employers cannot require employees to be vaccinated. I think actually that's, a, that, that's not correct. I think that's a, a misunderstanding. Yes, uh, and I didn't spend any time on that. I apologize. And um, with the vaccine receiving full authorization, you can still require it of your employees. It was just that a lot of the concerns at the outset were whether you could do that for a vaccine that hadn't received full approval, that had only received emergency approval. So in, in both situations, yes, you can require, you can mandate um, vaccinations. Yeah. Um, and I did see one that I do know the answer to uh, that was just asking whether we knew um, whether the holding in Houston Medical is limited to healthcare providers, and it was not. Um, you know, essentially what was said was, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of take it further and talk about OSHA a little bit. And, um, you know, employers have a responsibility to provide a work, a safe work site. And it was determined that, you know, they had made um, a reasoned decision that that was what they needed to do to provide a safe work site. Now, some of their facts that helped them reach that decision in their case were related to being in the healthcare industry, but it wasn't, it didn't rely upon that for the finding. Thanks, Marie. Uh, what, why don't we do one more? There's a great question here that I've thought a fair amount about as well. Uh, and why don't we answer that and then we'll move on and we'll answer some of the questions about collecting and disclosing uh, in your next section. Uh, this says, how do we address accommodations? Or sorry, we are collecting proof of vaccination and are providing incentives upon providing proof of vaccination. We are encouraging but not mandating vaccinations. How do we manage exceptions due to accommodations, that would be religious or medical, and how do we manage incentives when these employees request an incentive? You know, that's, a, I think, a really interesting question, how you balance uh, incentives with uh, what we typically would think of as accommodations in a required policy. Initial thoughts on that, I'm happy to dig in on that as well. Yeah, and um, we've, Ryan and I have talked about this a few times together in the past, and um, I would say the main thing to think about is um, how large is the incentive and what type of incentive is it? If it is so large or such, a, um, such, such an important benefit that it might be considered coercion, if somebody were not to participate, then you need to most likely provide for those people with religious or medical exemptions to also participate in the incentive. Um, but if it's, if it's a smaller incentive, if you're saying like, okay, if you get vaccinated, you get the day off and maybe you get the next day off because we know there's likely to be side effects. Um, you know, that's considered, you know, what we might call a de minimis incentive. But if you offer somebody a month of paid leave to get vaccinated, you know, that's much bigger and it might be considered coercive. And so, so that is sort of like a, a general guidepost that you can think about in that situation. Um, Ryan, would you yeah, go I, further? I'm no, I, I agree. I think that's a good way to think about it. I, I, I think that companies are not required to provide incentives to individuals who choose not to get vaccinated, even if they're choosing not to do so for religious or medical reasons. Now, there may be uh, a good reasons that you, as a company, you want to provide an incentive to those individuals as well. If, if they, they, have a, they can provide you with medical documentation, or they have a religious belief that would prevent them from being vaccinated. But if your incentive is not particularly large. We've seen some companies that give a hundred dollar 
Publix grocery store, for example, I think they were giving $125 gifts card to Publix to their employees once they showed proof of vaccination. Other companies, as Marie mentioned, have, have provided time off. Some companies provided a uh, 50 or $75 uh, contribution to the employee's portion of their health care. And so we've seen a lot of different types of incentives and incentives of that nature that are not particularly large. I, I don't think they need to be necessarily provided to those who uh, would otherwise qualify for a religious or uh, medical exemption if it was a required policy. But if you get larger, if you talk about training opportunities or uh, extended time off or larger monetary amounts, not having access to those incentives could be what we call in employment law an adverse employment action and could give rise to a discrimination case. So I think you need to be careful just to make sure that your incentives are enough, hopefully, to move the needle and encourage people to get vaccinated, but not so much that those who cannot be vaccinated uh, are, are left out of something that really affects their employment. Um, Okay, so we can we can move on. I will give. There's one more question that came in that I think is worth discussing. Why we're why we're chatting about this? How should we address accommodations if we allow employees the option to go to the office if they're fully vaccinated, but no one is required to go to the office? In other words, this would be for someone who is unable to get a vaccine but wants to go into the office. What do, what do you think about that one, Marie? I think that's an interesting one that that we may run yeah. into as a company. Mm -hmm. I, I think in that situation, um, you know, look at why they want to go into the office. You you might discover that there's a reason that, you know, working from home is problematic for the employee. And maybe there is some kind of accommodation that you do want to um, offer to them. But it doesn't have to be that you let them go into the office um, because you do have a mandatory policy in place. You know, we we have you know, law, we have guidance from the EEOC. We, you know, we have a lot telling us that you are allowed to do that. But the main thing to think about is being even-handed to make sure that somehow your policy isn't unintentionally discriminatory. And um, so again, like, you know, look into it further. Um, but, you know, if they're not required to go in and it doesn't impact their job. So when I say like, you know, 650, everybody has the option to stay home. It, there's not like that unspoken rule that, but if you don't come in, you won't get promoted. If you don't come in, you won't have the opportunity for these additional benefits. Um, so as long as there's not a situation like that happening, um, you, you should be fine to still say, well, we're still not gonna let you come in. We understand, but you're not vaccinated. And we've decided you know, for safe, health and safety reasons, that's what we're doing. Um, but let's look at your situation where you are working from and see if there are some accommodations, some teleworking support that we might need to offer you. Um, that, that would be helpful, that would make sure that we're not unintentionally discriminating. I would add that another thing that we've done is say, this is a temporary policy Why we evaluate, we're in a, a time of surge with the Delta variant, and this is our current policy, we're going to reevaluate, and that this isn't necessarily a long-term policy. The other thing that I've heard of companies doing is, for example, companies in California where unvaccinated uh, individuals mm -hmm. are required to wear masks in uh, indoor spaces and vaccinated individuals are not. And I know that's inconsistent with the CDC's current <laughs> guidance, but I have seen companies that have said, for example, vaccinated individuals don't have to wear masks or continue to social distance, whereas we'll let unvaccinated individuals come into the office, but they need to wear a mask and they're required to social distance. And so there are steps that you could take in that, uh, I think in that setting, but it may be easiest to go the route that, that Marie mentioned and to say, especially now why we're having this surge in the Delta variant, we're only letting vaccinated individuals come in. And I think that's that's interesting. Yeah, and, and I would also say, you know, with that, I, I would recommend that if you decide to, to let them come in, I would say follow the CDC guidance and have everybody wearing a mask um, if, if they're coming into the work site. Um, just because again, like the whole purpose of this is that you wanna keep your workforce safe you also want to keep your liability low. Um, you want to make sure you don't have outbreaks within your workforce that are going to impact your ability to carry on business as usual. You know, th those are all like really important things to keep in mind as you're deciding well which policy makes the most sense. Yeah, yeah, lots of great questions here. Well, let's move into health screening and we can revisit some of these questions. We got some really interesting thoughts, and, and these are the kind of situations I think that businesses are facing. And there's a, there's a lot of nuance there, and I, I think uh, it's it's fun to get to to talk through these. 
you know, health screening is interesting because it was initially a huge part of the return to the work site. States across the country were requiring it. Businesses were using health screening. And then as more people got vaccinated and the numbers began to dip, uh, the number of states that have required health screening has shrunk. Uh, it, I think it's, it's beginning to, to build back up again. But for a lot of people, health screening was a big part of going back to work or working during the pandemic. And, and for those of you that haven't done health screening, it typically includes either a questionnaire and or a temperature check. And that's a temperature check that could be performed at home or, or in an office. The questionnaire can also be performed, uh, filled out at home and at that office. And because this is something that we've been doing for a long time, there are a lot of tools out there that companies can use to do health screening. We provide a health screening tool uh, it's relatively inexpensive and can be filled out in really probably under a minute. And you fill out kind of whether you have been in close contact, whether you have symptoms, whether you've tested positive. It asks you some follow-up questions. And then it sends you an email saying that you are authorized to come into the office or you can't come into the office and the HR will contact you. And so in a matter of a minute, you can quickly fill that out, know whether you're authorized, and then head into the office or stay home if that's uh, the instruction you're given. And it's become a matter of habit for a lot of our employees. They just get on, uh, it's a URL, they fill it out. And so a lot of companies have different ways that they do health screening and it's become something that's uh, just a par part of their routine as they prepare for work. But it's interesting, as health screening requirements have dropped away, many companies have decided to continue health screening. And I'll tell you at 650, uh, especially during this surge with the Delta variant, we are only allowing vaccinated individuals to come into our office and we are having everyone who comes to the office fill out a health screener regardless of their vaccination status uh, be before they come into the office and so that's kind of the path that we've taken and we've done it for a couple of reasons and, and these are the benefits that we've heard from com companies as they've thought about health screening first it helps to keep sick employees from coming into company work sites and it's been interesting as we've talked to companies, many companies have said, you know, we had a problem in the past with people coming into the work site if they had a cough, maybe they had a walking pneumonia, they had a, a, a light flu, but they felt like they needed to come into work. And the health screener, in addition to keeping out people who potentially have COVID, has kept employees who are sick with other things from coming into the workplace. And they found that's a real benefit. And that benefit may be on the uptick as we move into flu season. I know I've started to get notifications from my pharmacy that it's time to go and think about getting my flu shot. You know, th this is, I think, a real benefit that companies are seeing of the health screener. Health screeners can also be used for contractors, suppliers, and visitors. And I think that's important because if you're a business that has people coming in and out, it's easy to have a, a, a way to make sure that they're screened as well so you can protect your employees and you can protect others who are coming into your work site. The other thing that's nice about using a health screener is it can help your company maintain a record of who is working at company work sites. And this can be useful in a couple of different situations. If, and we hope this doesn't happen uh, to your business, but if you have someone at your business who gets COVID-19, it's helpful to be able to know who they may have come into contact with. And that uh, a health screener can be helpful in, in that regard and that you'll have a record of who was in the office uh, on the days that, that the individual may have been in there. I think it can also help you to understand kind of what your workforce is thinking about working at your work site. You can see trends and numbers as people come into the work site. And then finally, a, another benefit is that a daily screener can help reinforce the company's policies and expectations regarding health and safety. I know in our work screener, the email that's sent out says, you're authorized to go into the office, please be sure to follow all of our COVID-19 policies and procedures. It's a chance to re-emphasize that for your employees every time that they go into your workspace. And so interestingly, I think that, that health screeners are likely here to stay even in states where they're not required and that we may see companies actually an increase in the use of health screeners. Let me just... Uh, touch on that a little bit more, you know, there are a couple reasons why I think we may see that increase. And one is that with the Delta variant, we're seeing more breakthrough cases. And that's cases of COVID-19 where an individual has been vaccinated. And while the vaccine provides uh, significant protection against infection, 
uh, vaccinated individuals are still getting COVID-19. They can still have it. And so it's important, even if you have a policy that only allows individuals who are fully vaccinated to come to your work site, that you have a way to make sure that they're screened. Uh, and I think that's important. You know, I think a lot of companies have this dual approach that we're, uh, we've adopted at 650, where they're only allowing vaccinated individuals to come in and they're using a health screener. Uh, and I think that this trend will likely continue as well as we learn more about the need for booster shots. Uh, as uh, Marie mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine has been approved for emergency use uh, for booster shots for people who are immunocompromised. And I think that as we learn more about sort of the, the levels of protection that are provided by the vaccines over time, I think companies will see that it's important for them to continue to screen because those who received the vaccine early this year now have been going on six, seven, eight months since they, they received their vaccination. You know, th their protection may be waning. And I think there's increased need in those types of situations for a health screener. And so I, I do think health screeners, which kind of were a hot issue and then died off, are, are going to come back to the fore as something that companies are looking to as a tool to help protect both their employees and others who enter their work sites. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come back and I know there's some, some thoughts about health screeners, but uh, we had a lot of questions about both health screening information and vaccination information and how you can store it and what the privacy considerations are and how you can share it. And I think we're really fortunate to have Marie uh, with us today because Marie helps companies to comply with the CCPA and the GDPR and is really an expert on privacy issues, but also uh, ha ha is is leading up the charge on our team at 650 for COVID issues. And so she kind of has a nice intersection, uh, understanding of the intersection between these two issues. There's nothing like being the person at the company that keeps telling everybody, yes, you have to keep filling out that screener. Um, so I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking and we have received a few questions about the issues with collecting and storing vaccine documentation in particular. So I'm going to talk both about like collection storage of vaccine documentation, but also screener documentation. Um, so there's a few different laws and I'll focus on, on them each one at a time. I'm going to talk first for a few minutes about the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. Um, the ADA applies to your company if you have 15 or more employees. Uh, and the main thing to be aware of with ADA requirements in the situations we're talking about um, is that um, medical exams have to be related to and consistent with a business necessity. Um, and so uh, something like a screener qualifies, can qualify as a business necessity, I can't say words, during the pandemic. Um, but you need to remember to administer them even-handedly. So if you only have one employee who you're like every day making take that screener, that's a problem. Um, but as a general rule, as long as you're you know, following your policy and having your employees take the screener um, as they come into the work site, you'll be fine. Um, you, it also covers in addition to medical exams and um, medical records. So, you know, what qualifies there? Uh, Self-screening qualifies, a health professional screening. So um, we're seeing less of it now, but at one point in the pandemic, we did see some companies that were having, you know, like nurses or some sort of medical technician administer the screening at their work sites. Um, temperature taking, collection of a vaccination card, or vaccination self-reporting, all of those things create medical records. So like the temperature taking only creates a, is it an exam? It only creates a record if you record it. Um, but all of those things are either exams or create medical records. And so under the ADA, they have to be kept confidential. Um, any of the records have to be kept separate from the individual's personnel files. Um, and in terms of document retention, you have to keep them for at least a year after they were, were created or a year from employee termination, whichever is later. So um, if you have screener documentation from you know, June, 2021, and you fire the employee in August of 2021, instead of deleting it a year after it was created in June of 2022, you need to hold on to that information until August of 2022, because that's the later date between the termination and the actual creation of the record. So ADA, one year record retention minimum, um, has to be kept confidential, has to be kept separate from their personnel files. 
So that's the ADA. And, and, in, and in a lot of ways, the ADA is the simplest of them. It's just, it's all medical records. It all gets treated the same way. Now, what's a little bit more complicated is OSHA. So under OSHA, um, employees have the right to access their medical records that are kept by their employers. And that right lasts for 30 years after their employment ends. So these are for anybody who's um, keeping track of your OSHA record keeping. This is that nightmare record that you have to keep forever, basically. It feels like forever, um, 30 years. So which records fall under the 30-year OSHA rule? Um, any, any medical records um, that concern your health status and were created or maintained by a healthcare professional are medical records under OSHA. So that means that under OSHA, if a health professional is doing the screening, that's a medical record under OSHA. If you are you know, scanning somebody's vaccination card, the card was created by their doctor or the medical tech, whoever it was that gave them the vaccination shot. And so that's a medical record under OSHA. However, um, sorry, and, and also um, medical exams and laboratory tests. So if you have somebody turn in their actual COVID test results, that's a medical record. Um, medical records don't include self-attestation. So if I self-screen um, or if I self-report my vaccination to you, that's not a medical record under OSHA. And that's the reason why a lot of companies are choosing to go the self-attestation self route because they don't want to worry about the 30-year record requirement under the OSHA rules. So um, again, like in terms of ease, uh, it's a little bit easier to comply with the ADA here than with OSHA. Uh, so I'm just going to check super fast. I think there was a question about this one. Oh, yes. Let me quickly address contractors. So with all of these things, you can do the same thing with contractors. You can um, ask them to screen. You can ask them um, to report their vaccination status. If you have a vaccination policy in place for anybody, you know, that's entering your work site. Um, the rules are a little bit different in terms of uh, record retention. I would recommend that you follow the um, shortest, like keep that record for the shortest time period you can. So if you have a contractor who's sort of like, you know, your contractor for six months, they're coming in every day. Um, that is more akin to, you know, um, it, it's not clear, right? I would say keep that record and have a clear um, record retention policy in place. And you tell that person when you'll be deleting their vaccination record. If it's like a one-time visitor or somebody who comes very intermittently, I would recommend doing the version where they either show it to somebody and you tick them as approved for the day or you have them self-attest. That's probably the safest route to go with contractors just from a practical perspective. Um, and then something else to keep in mind is California is a special case. Uh, so we have special privacy rules and that affect also the record keeping in California. Uh, so. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the CCPA. Uh, this is the California Privacy Act, um, which if, if we could advance one slide, please. Uh, this rule, uh, we have sort of a brief primer on who it applies to in case you're not familiar with the CCPA. 650 actually does offer a CCPA toolkit if you're in need of one. But essentially, um, if your company is doing uh, any business in California, so if you're for profit, and you collect or handle the personal information of California residents and do at least one of the following, this law applies to you. So if you collect the PI of any California residents and you have over 25 million in revenue, you get 50% or more of your re revenue from selling the personal information of California residents, or you handle the personal information of 50,000 or more uh, persons, devices, or households in California. Um, so if you fall into the one of those categories, this rule applies to you. And it means that you're required to um, give notice before you collect this information. So if you're collecting vaccination status, if you're doing health screeners, um, whether it's for contractors or employees or people entering the premises, like if you have visitors coming to the premises that have to do a screener, that have to do a temperature check, that have to show their vaccination card, um, they all have the right to notice in California. And um, so they need notice that meets the rules um, set up in the privacy regulation. So essentially, you can't do anything with the information that you don't tell them about in the notice. You um, can't collect additional information that you don't disclose in the notice. Uh, you can't share the information with any parties that you or categories of parties that you 
fail to tell them about in the notice. So the notice is very important. Um, with employees, uh, they under California law, they have the right to this privacy notice from you. So do your contractors. And so, you know, creating that notice, updating it, if you haven't updated it to reflect your vaccination or screening policies is really important and disseminating that to your employees, to your contractors. Um, if you are collecting this information about people who are not your employees or contractors, so the general public entering your premises, for example, um, in addition to all the notice rules, you also have to afford them their other rights under the CCPA, which include things like they need to be able to send you um, a request that you delete their information and you honor that request. So if you're unfamiliar with the CCPA, but looking at this makes you think it applies to you, strongly recommend you talk to somebody, um, somebody at 650 or your legal counsel uh, about getting, um, getting right with the CCPA. And on that note also, I did see something came in the chat um, that noted a, a, a great um, side note, which is that um, in Cal OSHA, under Cal OSHA, um, you are required to have your employees masking um, irrespective of their vaccination status right now. Um, so California is a special case in many ways. Um, and also on that note, somebody asked um, outside of California what the masking rules are. The CDC recommends that everyone be masked if they're indoors in close proximity at this time, if they're in a higher substantial transmission rate area. A lot of the country is in that situation right now, if you look on the map. Um, that is the CDC recommendation. Um, but again, outside of California, where there's a, a statewide mandate in place, you need to look at jurisdictional requirements um, that may be different based on your city or county um, when making your masking determinations. And if you need help with that, we do have a return to work tool set that can help you with that. Um, so, so that's sort of CCPA. It's a lot. If you're not already complying with it and think you need to, we can help you. Um, but also I'll just do a side note. If you have employees in Europe um, or the UK, I, if you have employees in the EU or the UK, um, screening and vaccination collection rules can be very different. Under the GDPR and the UK version of the GDPR, um, you are allowed to collect the information as long as you follow the necessary rules, which essentially mean that you have to do you know, a data protection impact assessment, you have to have proper notice, you have to um, have you know, set forth your purpose of processing and your purpose for processing special health data, um, and you have to follow data minimization rules. So there's a lot of rules around it, but under the privacy laws of Europe and the UK, it is allowed. However, when you get to um, state jurisdictional rules about whether you can ask these questions of your employees or require them to be vaccinated, that's where it gets different. So that it's not so much the privacy side that's a problem, it's the employment law side that could become a problem in those jurisdictions. So the UK, for example, um, as long as you put forth like a reasonable basis for protecting your workforce, you're generally allowed to do it. But in um, France, for example, you are not allowed to require vac vaccination of your employees. You can encourage it, but you can't require it. So um, again, privacy laws, you can get there. Um, employment laws, you need to double check your jurisdictions if you're in Europe. And I will quickly bring us to Gina, which is the last privacy law we're gonna talk about today. And one that I feel like is probably the least familiar to, to most people. Um, so GINA is the Gen Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, it prevents employers from requesting, requiring, or purchasing genetic information about their employees or applicants. Um, and genetic information under this law includes family medical history, which would be, for example, manifestation of a disease in a family member. So when you're running your screeners, you can't ask, do any of your family members have COVID? you can ask if any of their close contacts have COVID, which is a better question anyway, because they might've had close contact with somebody outside of their family. Um, so keep in mind, like when we're asking questions, don't solicit information about their family when you're determining whether they're a health risk. Um, but also there's some special rules about vaccination under GINA um, about what kinds of programs you can and can't administer. So the real question here, the real, division point is whether or not you as the employer 
are actually um, doing vaccination programs on your premises and offering the vaccinations yourself, or you're telling them you're required to get vaccinated, go do it. You know, go find your healthcare provider, go find the public health provider. Um, so as an employer, you are allowed to administer vaccines to both your employees and to their family members. Um, I used to regularly, I used to work for a university system and they would regularly have like a little like flu shot kiosk. I could go, my family members could go. That's fine. Um, you can ask your employees for their proof of vaccination uh, as we've already established under the other rules. Um, you can offer incentives to, for both your employees and for their family members becoming vaccinated. So, you know, I administer a health plan, you know, it's better for our costs overall for everybody on the health plan to be vaccinated, which includes family members, I can offer an incentive. Um, however, if I, the employer, am actually the one administering that vaccination to the employees and their family members, then I cannot offer an incentive to the family members. That's because during that medical, um, that medical procedure where I'm asking them questions, so I'm about to give them a vaccine, I'm asking them the questions to make sure they're eligible for the vaccine um, as the healthcare provider. I also have to ask them about who they're related to because that's, I need that information so the employer can give the incentive. So now I'm an employer who's administered a health exam and asked for genetic information. So you can't do that. Um, you can offer the incentive if family members get their vaccination elsewhere and just offer you the proof of vaccination. So it's a weird differentiation. Um, it's just easiest not to administer it yourself. That's kind of the takeaway here in terms of what you can and can't do under GINA. Um, so don't ask your employees about their um, family members' COVID positive, COVID negative status. Um, and uh, don't offer incentives if you're also the one who's administering the vaccine. Uh, don't offer incentives to the um, employees' family members. Thanks, Marie. Uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's a lot there uh, as you go through those privacy laws. I think we have some, some interesting questions. Why don't we save those for the Q&A at the end and we'll revisit this. But I, we want to wrap up just with some best practices and some helpful resources before we get to, to answering your question. And the best practices are, are a little more at a high level, but it's interesting as we've been working with businesses now for over a year in returning to work and addressing the challenges that come with the pandemic, we're, we're seeing some really... Uh, I, I think strong best practices emerge, some characteristics of businesses that are, are successful during this time. And one of them is strong leadership and culture. This has been a real strain on businesses. And uh, I think businesses that have thrived during this time have had strong leadership and they've had a strong culture. They've also taken a proactive approach to changing circumstances. I think the pandemic has really forced businesses to be on the front foot. They can't always be sort of sitting back uh, and, and, and doing only what they're forced to do. And I think that proactive approach is important. Also important is clear communication channels. I, I don't know if there's ever been a time where communication with employees is more important. And this is a time where employees wanna know what they're required to do and what the company is doing to protect them. And I think it's, it's crucial, really, that companies are communicating with their employees, not only what the rules are, but the reasons behind those rules. And I, I think, you know, we've seen this play out several times in the vaccination situation where there are strong feelings among those who want everyone to be vaccinated. There are strong feelings for people who don't want to be vaccinated. And it's important, I think, for companies to say, this is our policy and this is the reason. You know, at 650, we're requiring vaccinations for people to come into the office. And we explained that the health and safety of our employees, our suppliers, and those who come into our office space is paramount. And that we feel like vaccinations uh, are, are crucial to helping us sort of meet that obligation. And we explained that uh, in a detailed way so that our employees knew why we were making that decision. Relatedly, I think a strong policy foundation is needed. It's difficult for employees if they feel like decisions are just being made ad hoc. Whereas companies that come out with a written vaccination policy, even if it has to be amended over time, can provide that policy to their employees who can look at it, they can think about it, they can review it later, they can ask questions about it. And I think that strong policy foundation extends beyond vaccination policies or health screening policies, or even return to work site policies, which are all things that we help companies with, to employee handbooks and to policies in general. 
you know, a strong policy foundation can help a company to be able to say, listen, these are the decisions we've made. We put them in writing so you can understand them and you can access them yourself. And I think that's been really important for companies. And then finally is this focus on health and wellness. I think this has been an opportunity for companies to show that they really value their employees and that they're concerned about their health and wellness. And I think companies that have taken those concerns seriously and have prioritized health and wellness have seen benefits during the pandemic as they've increased uh, their employee loyalty and uh, the, the happiness that their employees have with the company, but they've also been able to avoid many of the challenges that COVID-19 has presented to companies. Uh, I agree with that. I think especially when you mentioned like the ad hoc approach, so many of us were there at the beginning of the pandemic. There was really no other way to respond, you know, but now we're in a place where we have time. We figured out how to be quick and nimble. You know, we're, we're able to, you know, put together, most companies have like either a committee or an individual who's tasked with making sure we're approaching this in a reasoned manner. Um, and, you know, we're, we're much, we're all much better situated to deal with emergencies than we were, you know, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, I, I want to apologize really quickly. I, somebody sent me a note. I completely failed to address HIPAA, which I have an entire slide on. <laughs> Let me just quickly tell you a couple of things about HIPAA before we do a couple of these Q and A's. Um, so essentially the most important thing to be aware of with HIPAA is, which is the law that most people mention the most often when you ask about vaccination status or screening there for COVID. HIPAA only applies to what are called covered entities. These are your healthcare providers, your insurers, your medical billing companies. The vast majority of companies do not have to comply with HIPAA. And so if somebody says that's a violation of my HIPAA right, they're probably wrong, most likely. Um, HIPAA is about the release of protected health information without somebody's consent. So also if they're like, you can't ask me that, it's against HIPAA for you to ask me. That's also not quite right. Um, the problem is if you then released what they said without their consent to another party. Um, so HIPAA does require that personal health information be kept confidential and safe from security threats. It requires um, covered entities to train their employees about the requirements of HIPAA so that they can follow them. But HIPAA, and this is again, is where you're probably the most likely to run into it, say if you're you know, having people show vaccination cards to enter your premises, or you're having them do a health screener and they say, that's a violation of HIPAA. HIPAA does not prevent an employer, a restaurant, a gym, you know, a gas station to, from asking you for your vaccination status. So um, that's probably one of the laws you're the most likely to run into when it doesn't apply. People will think it applies to them. They'll tell you, you can't ask me that. And they're typically going to be wrong. Not in every situation, but they will typically be wrong about it in our current situation, unless you are you know, a covered entity or in the healthcare space, essentially. So there's a little primer on HIPAA. Sorry about missing that slide earlier. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Ryan. Thank you, Marie. And I, I think that's an important one because I think HIPAA is one of the most misunderstood and uh, wrongly quoted statutes that's come out of the, the pandemic. So a lot of people uh, I think are, have, have a misunderstanding of that. Thanks for clearing that up. Well, I'm just gonna conclude before we get to questions with some helpful resources. Uh, you know, one thing that we have seen is that uh, successful businesses have leveraged industry groups, chambers of commerce. We've worked with the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce on a number of different events and their professional networks to find best practices and innovative approaches to problem solving. You know, there are a lot of companies that are going through similar challenges to what you're going through. And I think there's, there's something to be said for uh, joining in with these groups and, and kind of working through that. Um, in addition, I think that uh, th there's a real benefit to making full use of government resources, including guidance from the CDC, state and local governments. Uh, there are some really excellent resources out there. The CDC has a number of different pages that kind of lay out, I think, in, in pretty good detail, uh, steps that you can take to, to protect workers in your, in your workplaces. And then finally, I would say to, that, that it helps to look for ways that technology can make problem solving easier and less expensive. And that's certainly something that we're passionate about at 650. Uh, you know, I, we're fortunate to have technology that can really uh, simplify some of the, the most onerous parts of trying to comply with the pandemic. Um, and I, I'm just gonna show you on the next slide, a couple of examples of things that we do at 650 to help companies. We try to make our solution uh, 
something that companies of all sizes can afford and, and it's easy to use. And so what we do is we actually create a document generation engine, as you can see sort of on the left hand of this slide. The nice thing about an engine is you can go in and drive it as often as you want. And so if you're making a return to work policy or you're making a Cal OSHA COVID prevention program, or you're creating another type of document, you can go in there and run that engine. And then if you decide to change your policy, you can go in there and run it again. And you answer a series of questions, uh, kind of like TurboTax, and then it spits out a policy that's customized to you in Word that you can further customize. So instead of having an attorney write a policy for you that may be out of date by the time it gets through the review process, we give you an engine that we continually update and that you can drive as often as you want. And then the other thing that we do for companies is we monitor the law and update them on changes. And so on the right-hand side of the slide is an update we pushed out uh, just today, this morning, uh, updating our customers on some of the changes we've seen, including that the FDA gave full authorization to the Pfizer uh, vaccine. And we go sort of state by state over the states that we cover to explain how the law has changed in those different states. You know, San Francisco has some new rules that require signage. We have a hyperlink to that signage and we kind of walk you through those types of changes. And so there are ways that you can uh, use technology to help uh, handle some of these challenges. And if you're interested in, in learning more about our solution, uh, of course, you can visit us at, at www650 slash employment. But there are a lot of great solutions out there. You know, I want to save time. I know we're at the top of the hour. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Maybe we could just take a couple minutes, Marie, to answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A. Yeah, um, there's a couple that I, I wanted to call out. Um, there were some questions about applicability with the 15 employee rule. Um, it's 15 employees total, not employees at one work site. Well, so if you have 15 employees, um, the ADA is implicated no matter where they're located. Um, similarly, I failed to mention for Gina, the, the rule is the same. It's a 15 employee threshold for Gina to apply to your company. So um, both of the situations, 15 employees total, even if they're at separate work sites. Um, okay, I'm gonna mark those ones while we find the next, let me just get the next one. Oh, um, there's another question again, implicating privacy concerns. Um, so if a general temperature screening worksheet is maintained at say the reception desk and employees are recording their temperature every day, is that a violation of confidential information as other employees will see the recorded temperatures by the other employees? And, and I would say, yes, if that is your practice, I would end it now. Um, if, if you want it to be recorded, if it's at the reception desk, you could have the receptionist record it so nobody else is seeing the sheet and she's a limited person. You'll need to give the reception, or she or he, sorry. Um, you'll need to give the receptionist some training about keeping information confidential. Um, the other option though, is that you could have them self attest um, and just you know mark that they have tested themselves. And that way they wouldn't be seeing one another's, um, you know, actual medical information would be, which would be the temperature itself. Um, so, so yeah, I would change that practice if, if you or someone you know is engaging in that practice. And that may be somewhere where technology helps, right? Like if, if people are able to enter their temperature in to technology where it's not on a sheet that everyone could see, that may be a, a better practice in that front. Uh, you know, I'll jump in also, there's been a number of questions and comments about California uh, in the comments. My understanding in California is that Cal OSHA requires uh, unvaccinated individuals to wear masks inside uh, and does not require vaccinated individuals to do so. This is the Cal OSHA regulation uh, and that it does not require masks outside, but that the California Department of Health has recommended, like the CDC, that vaccinated individuals also wear masks inside in public indoor spaces that would include office buildings. And so California is in a bit of an interesting spot where I think the California Department of Health has made a recommendation and Cal OSHA, uh, my understanding is that Cal OSHA hasn't updated its regulations yet. And so that's, I think, an yes, interesting uh, issue there. Apologies, and I think I misspoke. I think I said Cal OSHA when I was referring to their Department of Health recommendations earlier, so. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Marie, do, do we wanna answer? I think we've gotten a lot of the questions here. Um, and uh, are there any others you wanna just try to quickly answer before we sign off? Um, I would just say there, there's a, a few more that are asking some, some more specific questions about you know collection essentially. 
uh, we'll we'll try to answer all of those in the follow up because we will we will send out a follow up email that has the slide deck in it and um, we'll um, look for those questions that we have not gotten to in the in the chat because a number of questions did come in so. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's been a great discussion. I think that the questions have been excellent. We also want to invite you to our webinar tomorrow, which will be fe featuring Marie, uh, again, talking about the PIPL, that's China's new data privacy law. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can visit 650.com uh, and we'll put something in the chat here so that you can sign up for the webinar tomorrow and watch for uh, notice of uh, future webinars uh, that involve the return to work, vaccination, health screening, these types of issues. This is a dynamic situation and, and there are always changing circumstances and things to, to talk about. And again, if any of the solutions that we've talked about would be helpful for your business, please don't hesitate to visit us at www.650 slash employment. Uh, and we can, we can give you a demo or show you any of the tools that we have. As we said, we try to uh, set a price that can help any business uh, to, to make this a more efficient process. And with that, we'll sign off. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Ryan.